This is FAU's Research in Action. So what is Research in Action? Normally, we hold the seminars for our community to communicate what great research is ongoing here on campus. But normally, these are virtual. So we're very happy that this time, you know, occasionally we are mixing it up. And this time, we are hosts of the OSHA Lifelong Learning Institute here. So thank you to um, Jane Morgan and her team for uh, organizing this together with us. Um, so Research in Action was designed to really communicate on what's going on here on campus aside from teaching students. There's a lot more going on, a lot more that actually affects the community, um, you. And we wanted to communicate that out. Um, so if you are more, if you're interested in hearing more about that, look online, uh, look for FAU Research in Action. We have recordings of past events on all kinds of different topics. And we have a list of upcoming events. Actually, our next virtual seminar is already on Thursday. Today's speaker is uh, a very special treat, and it's my great honor to introduce him. Dr. Ellen Berger is the, I have to put my glasses on, um, the Rad Radock Family Eminent Scholar Chair for Holocaust Studies, which is the first Holocaust chair established in the state of Florida. He's also professor of Judaic Studies at Florida Atlantic and the director for the Center for the Study of Values and violence after Auschwitz. He was, prior to, to coming to FAU, he was professor at Syracuse University, and before that, at College of William and uh, Mary. He authored and co-authored 11 books. Can you imagine? Um, so he's a, a world-renowned um, specialist in, uh, on the Holocaust, Auschwitz, Jewish American literature, theology, Christian Jewish relations throughout America and in Europe, Australia, South Africa, and Israel. With that, I'm just going to turn it over to Dr. Berger so he can tell us about surviving the Holocaust. Welcome. Thank you, Thank you very much for that warm introduction. It was the kind of introduction my father would have loved and my mother would have believed, and that, that's good to know. But let me get started here about Elie Wiesel. It's a name that uh, most of you are familiar with. Uh, you've heard about him, you've seen him, you've read about him. And uh, I want to say some things about him here. So there's a picture. Um, Wiesel was a deeply religious youngster. He was asked once by his teacher, uh, why did I pray? And his response was, why did I breathe? So the way you and I breathe, that's the way he viewed prayer. It was an inextricable part of his very being as a human. He said that he was more familiar with the Jerusalem of King David than with the streets of Siget. And yet when he was growing up, he had a great fear of Christians, rightly so. Christians regularly beat Jews on Christmas uh, not realizing that if Jesus were alive during the Holocaust, he would have died in the concentration and death camps. Um, let's see. So who was Elie Wiesel? Holocaust survivor, novelist, human rights activist, Nobel Peace Prize winner, Congressional Gold Medal winner, the author of nearly 60 books. He wrote all of his books in French at first, and they were translated primarily by his wife, Marianne. He won numerous literary prizes and humanitarian awards and has received nearly 200 honorary degrees, including one from FAU. He established the Elie Wiesel Foundation for Humanity, established the Wiesel Ethics Essay Contest, and was strongly influenced by the Jewish mystical tradition. Um, the question for Elie Wiesel no matter if he was writing a novel, a play, a cantata, or an essay, uh, what about God and all of this? How can we account for what's happening to us? There's a legend that a Jewish child was bricked in a pyramid, and the archangel Gabriel intervened, yet one and a half million Jewish children were murdered in the Holocaust, and there was no divine intervention. 
And for Wiesel, the question about God is never finally settled. He wrote, we cannot thank God for Jerusalem and not interrogate him about Treblinka. In other words, uh, you can't let God off the hook. <coughs> to put Wiesel into some kind of conceptual framework, uh, what do we think about the Holocaust and the problem of God? Well, there are several, <laughs> 10 major responses. The Holocaust is like all other tragedies. It merely re-raises the question of theodicy. How do you account for evil in the, uh, a God-created good world? Two, classical Jewish theological doctrine of mipinei chatenu, we are punished for our sins. Three, the Holocaust is the ultimate in vicarious atonement. Israel is the suffering servant portrayed in Isaiah. Um, the Holocaust is the modern Akedah. The Holocaust is a test of faith. Remember, Abraham was uh, required to sacrifice his son Isaac. The Holocaust, <laughs> pardon me, is an instance of a temporary eclipse of God. This is Martin Buber's position. <coughs> the Holocaust has proof that God is dead. The Holocaust has the maximum ex expression of human evil. The Holocaust is a revelation, a command for Jews to survive. The Holocaust does an inscrutable mystery. God's ways demand faith and silence. And finally, <coughs> in the tenth response, the Holocaust demands interrogation of both God and man. No satisfactory answers are coming from either side. That would be the response of Elie Wiesel. Okay. Here's a picture of Wiesel as a teenager before deportation. Here is a picture of Wiesel. Let me see. There he is in Buchenwald. Pardon? Here's the second in the second bunk right here. Okay. And finally, here is his picture on his last published work, Open Heart, in which he suffered uh, open heart surgery, uh, which brought him an additional five years, but finally did him in. Now, Knight, he said, was both the end of everything and the beginning of everything. He says that night begins where Anne Frank's diary ends. So what ended for Wiesel? Well, the belief, childlike, naive belief that whenever the Jewish people were threatened, God would intervene on their behalf. What began? Well, what began was a search for a new usable image of the deity after Auschwitz. Many years ago, the Christian scholar Harry James Cargis asked Wiesel whether he'd found a useful occupation for God. Several years after that, I asked him, and he said, yes, I have, but he doesn't listen. So, you know, God's a tough customer. Uh, his first three books, Night, which is a memoir, Dawn, which is a novel, and Day, uh, also a novel. These are his attempts to write himself away from the Jewish tradition. How can I possibly continue to believe? Now, for Wiesel, questions were far more important than answers. Why is that? The Hebrew word for question, she'elah, contains the name of God, El. Arguing with God and the Jewish tradition, moreover, has a long, long history. Remember Abraham? Well, you don't, I do. I was very young at the time. But Abraham is going to destroy uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Or God is going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham goes to see God and says, if you find 50 righteous people, will you spare the city? Yes. 40, yes. 30, yes. Finally, he gets God to agree that if he can find 10, 
righteous people in the city, he will spare the city. He didn't find 10, and the city was destroyed. But the proposition that man, this lowly human creature, can argue with God, the divine author of the universe, is right situated at the heart of the Jewish tradition. And then Levi Yitzchak, who was a famous Hasidic uh, tzaddik, had a discussion once with one of his disciples after Yom Kippur. And Levi Yitzchak says to his disciple, well, uh, how was your Yom Kippur? The disciple said, okay. I had an encounter with the deity. What happened? Asked the tzaddik. And the disciple said, well, the deity said, you have feasted when you should have fasted. You have ridden when you should have walked. You have disobeyed many commandments. So the tzaddik said, that's true. What did you say to the deity? I said, you have made widows out of women, orphans out of children, and wreaked havoc upon humanity. And God said, that's true. And then what happened, asked the tzaddik. And the disciple said, well, if you forgive me, I'll forgive you. And uh, Levi Yitzchak said, oh, you let him off too easily. You let him off too easily. And Elie Wiesel says this, questions keep the Jewish tradition alive. Um, just as after the destruction of the temple in the year 70, Judaism had to begin again. So too, after the Holocaust, we need a new Talmud, a new set of writings that can help God guide Jews and Judaism. Uh, now, these are scenes from night. What Wiesel says is, the Holocaust murdered my God. Yet several sentences later, he says, um, I will never forget that even if I'm condemned to live as long as God himself. Well, if the Holocaust murdered his God, who's the God he's talking about here? Well, this, the issue for Wiesel is not dualism, not two gods. The God that was murdered was the covenantal deity, the one who promised intervention on behalf of the Jewish people. The God who he says that even if he's condemned to live as long as, that's the God that is going to be the deity that the Jewish people need to believe in, to worship, to pray to after Auschwitz. And then there's the hanging of the child in Auschwitz. Three prisoners are arrested, two adults and one youngster. They're hung in front of the camp. The two adults die almost instantly, but the youngster, because of his light weight, swings on the rope, takes a long time to die. And Wiesel reports hearing a voice saying, where is God? Where is he now? And Wiesel said, there he is. He's hanging on the gallows. What was he talking about there? Because he doesn't believe in the death of God. He believes in the end of the covenantal God, the end of the God who Jews have worshipped for eternities that will intervene on their behalf. Now, well, who was Wiesel? He was the Magid, the storyteller of Siget. And I think it's important for all of us to realize when we talk about Elie Wiesel that um, there are two ways of doing theology in Judaism. One is via philosophical explorations. Maimonides comes to mind here. The other is telling stories, the Bible, the Midrashim, and other such uh, texts. These are stories about Jewish faith and belief. For example, Wiesel says that right before Pesach it was, the rabbi was going to go to the synagogue and preach a sermon on the necessity of giving charity to help the poor. And she said to him, how did it go? And he said, well, I was partially successful. 
And she said, what do you mean partially successful? How can you, do, how can you say that? So the rabbi said, well, I, can, I succeeded in convincing the poor. I didn't make out too good with the wealthy. Um, the other thing about night is you might think of the text, and it's a very short text, you might think of it as one ending, unending question, questioning the religious tenets of Judaism. Uh, it shattered a world, shattered a world. Um, there are uh, examples of the unheard witness, Moshe the Beetle, who was Wiesel's teacher of mysticism before the Holocaust, comes back. He escaped from uh, a Nazi murder machine action, and he told the people what he saw and that the Jews were being slaughtered. No one believed him. He was the unheard witness. There was Madame Schachter. She was the one who kept yelling, fire, fire, I see an enormous fire. But no one believed her either. And there was no fire. But when they got to Auschwitz, when the train stopped at Auschwitz, there was a fire. And then they believed her. Uh, the issue here is, is Wiesel himself the unheard witness? And that you'll have to figure out for yourselves. Does society hear Wiesel? Do they care about the message? Uh, the other thing about night is its inversion of biblical paradigms. The Akedah, the sacrifice of the son by the father. Abraham commanded to sacrifice Isaac. At the last moment before he's to plunge his dagger into Isaac, a ram appears in the thicket. The ram is substituted for Isaac. Presumably everyone is very happy except for the ram. But what is this? That's the classical paradigm. In night, that's inverted. It is sons sacrificing fathers. For example, on one death march, there uh, is the following story. Reb Eliyahu's son. Reb Eliyahu was a religious man who came into the cabin, a cabin, a, a bunk where Wiesel and his father were, and they said, <laughs> he said, have you seen my son? I've lost him. And Wiesel says, no, I haven't. After Reb Eliyahu left, he remembered he had seen him. The son kept running ahead, even though he saw his father fall behind. So here, it's the father being sacrificed by the son, an inversion of a biblical paradigm. Um, man is stronger than God. Wiesel says this on several occasions in night. I felt stronger than the Almighty. I was able to say no to him, and there was nothing he could do about it. And then there is a scene early on where he tells of seeing a group of prisoners, Jewish prisoners, saying the prayer for the dead for themselves. Now, it's never been the case in the history of the Jewish tradition where the living say the prayer for the dead, the Kaddish, for themselves. These are inversions of the classic paradigms of the tradition. And the reason why it's so important is that Wiesel is saying, look what happened to Judaism. The classical paradigms have been overturned. The new god or <laughs> gods are the Nazis. That's what he's trying to say. And then he says, make my prayers into tales. <coughs> he wants his prayers to become tales so that people will read them, hear them, and participate in them. Now, how about, how about Souls on Fire? This was a very important book published in the early 1970s, Portraits and Legends of Hasidic Masters. It was a tribute, is a tribute to his maternal grandfather, Dodi Feig. And it talks about a shift in power between humans and God. Humanity has to take a role in leading the world to salvation. <coughs> Moreover, 
Neo-Hasidism, Wiesel sees as a contemporary remedy for the many ails of society. For example, what does he see in Hasidism that might help us in our contemporary struggles? Well, one is its emphasis on friendship. Two, <laughs> it lessens the solitude of individuals. <coughs> um, there are many examples of solitude of individuals. Uh, I remember once being at a local restaurant, and in walks a man and his two daughters. They were seated, and the first thing they did, before even looking at the menu, was to take out their cell phones. Each began speaking on their cell phone, I assume not to each other. So we seem to have lost the ability to connect with one another. Uh, it is in man, <laughs> says Wiesel, that God must be loved. Value your fellow creatures. Value them. Contemporary humanity is moved and troubled by Hasidic tales. Why is that? Because, for Wiesel, there are parallels between the 18th and 20th century. Friendship versus aloneness. Meaning versus purpose, purposelessness. Um, Wiesel, you might think of <laughs> as kind of a literary Pied Piper. Love versus despair. Uh, reach out to your fellow man. This was his message. Doty Feig, his maternal grandfather, who never in his life read a novel, wound up uh, being a figure in many of Wiesel's novels because he embodied this kind of reaching out to one's fellow man, this emphasis on friendship, and uh, this emphasis upon love. Now, Bertrand Russell spent the high holy days, uh, this is out of place, but I will change that. No, I won't. Um, the fact is that in 1965, Elie Wiesel wrote a book called The Jews of Silence. The Jews of Silence was a book that recounted Wiesel's experience in the Soviet Union. The Jews at, at the Soviet Union, approximately three million of them, were being persecuted by the Soviet authorities. Um, even Bertrand Russell, the philosopher, wrote on behalf of the Jews of the Soviet Union. Um, the situation of the Jews was awful. There were informers, there were Jewish agents of the secret police. Nobody could speak freely. Um, the rabbis had to be very careful about what they were saying. This began to change after the appearance of the Jews of Silence. The Jews of Silence, incidentally, were not the Jews of the Soviet Union. They were the Jews of North America, whom Wiesel accused of abandoning their brethren, of turning their backs on them, of indifference. And for Wiesel, the opposite of love was not hate, it was indifference. Wiesel soon joined forces with Abraham Joshua Heschel, and both of them were instrumental in leading efforts to rescue uh, the Soviet, Jew Soviet Jewish population. Um, two prominent non-Jewish politicians were also very important here. Scoop Jackson, Jackson and, and um, Representative Charles Vanek. Jackson from the state of Washington and Vanek from Indiana wrote a bill which in fact linked the amount of aid the Soviet Union could get from uh, America to the uh, freedom that the Soviet Union was willing to allow its Jewish citizens. Following Wiesel's Nobel Prize ceremony, he returned to his hotel and spent the afternoon, he and his wife Marion, spent the afternoon speaking on the telephone with Jews in the Soviet Union. He says that it was a true human meeting, that it was very profoundly important and impactful. 
And I think that he also said elsewhere, if I should be remembered for anything, I would hope it would be uh, for my involvement with Soviet Jewry. So for Wiesel, this was a very, very high priority. Uh, this is the Jews of Silence, finally. The other thing about the Jews of Silence is it represented a major literary shift for Wiesel from a spokesman for the dead, that is the Holocaust victims, to a spokesman for the living, for the Jews of the Soviet Union. Um, it represented also his fight for social justice, his fight for human rights. Wiesel has said elsewhere that wherever Jews are in trouble, that place must become the center of our universe. That's what is demanded of the Jewish people. OK, let me just go back. In his novel, The Forgotten, Wiesel makes an impassioned plea his main character is a Holocaust survivor who is suffering from Alzheimer's. He has to transmit to his son his Holocaust experiences while he still remembers them. Uh, it's a very painful book to read, very important book to read. Uh, and it talks about the paradox of faith. What does it mean to have faith after the Holocaust? What does it mean to have a belief in God after the Holocaust? This is what Wiesel is interested in. Uh, these are the questions. The paradox of faith. Now, can memory be transfused? You can have a blood transfusion. You can have a platelet transfusion. Can you transfuse memory? That's the question. Is it possible for a survivor to transfuse his or her memory to his or her offspring. And Wiesel says, no, it's not possible. You can tell them about it. You can speak to them about it. But you cannot transfuse your memory. And in the beginning of The Forgotten, there are three primary statements that Wiesel makes. The beginning is actually a prayer. The prayer is uttered by a survivor named Elchanan. And the prayer goes like this. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, forget not their son who calls upon them now. You well know you, capital Y, source of all memory, that forget is to abandon, to forget is to repudiate. Do not abandon me, God of my fathers, for I have never repudiated you. Then the next, God of Auschwitz. What a statement, God of Auschwitz. What could that possibly mean? Know that I must remember Auschwitz and that I must remind you of it. I didn't think God was capable of forgetting. But here, there's an indictment. God of Treblinka, let the sound of that name make me and you, again, capital Y, tremble now and always. God of Belzec, let me and you weep for the victims of Belzec. Remember, God of history, that you created man to remember. You put me into the world. You spared me in time of danger and death that I might testify. What sort of witness would I be without my memory? And here's the nub of the issue. Wiesel often said that he would not want to be the last survivor because of the burden of memory and the responsibility. Memory, zahor, or some form of that verb, is listed 169 times in the Hebrew Bible. What are humans without their memory? Memory is crucial. Memory is what distinguishes us from other animals. Um, if we don't have memory, we don't have a destiny. If we don't have a past, we don't have a future. And Wiesel was keenly aware of that. Now, faith and doubt. Here are the two issues 
that all people struggle with. They go to doubt. They go together, says Wiesel. Doubt as an inoculation against feeling we have more faith than we actually do. In other words, don't sprain your wrist patting yourself on the back because you have so much faith unless you have doubt. Doubt is what keeps you honest. We have to question both faith and doubt. Only a wounded faith, he says, is worthy of a silent God. Faith becomes an act of protest for Brazil to go on as if God continues to exist and care for us. This is an act of protest, an angry faith, an activist faith, a faith with teeth, he writes. The opposite of love is not hate, it is indifference. If we are indifferent, we are not human. If we are indifferent, we are not human. So faith and doubt are the two poles around which human existence revolves. We can't have doubt alone. We can't have faith alone. They serve to keep us honest. Can't have one without the other. Now, Wiesel also says elsewhere, in a very dramatic moment, that in Auschwitz he beheld a trial of God. There were three or four rabbis. There were, there were witnesses for God, witnesses against God. At the end of a multi-day period, the jury returned its verdict, God is guilty. Then the chief of the rabbinic court said to his colleague, let us go pray. Let us go pray. That's the kind of faith that Wiesel is talking about. It's not either or, it's both. And he had an evolving relationship with Christianity. Before the Holocaust, Christians played a role in his world as objects of fear. Christians typically went around beating up Jews. Um, Wiesel met Francois Mauriac, a Catholic writer, after the war. Uh, Mauriac won the 1952 Nobel Prize in Literature. Wiesel says, I owed him my career. Uh, in a dramatic encounter, Wiesel went to see Mauriac, and Mauriac was going on and on about Jesus. And Wiesel said, excuse me, sir, but I know a place not far from here where Jewish children underwent agony six million times greater than that of Jesus. And he left the apartment. But Moriah came after him and urged him to come back and speak some more. He also urged him to write his memoir. And in every copy of that, in every edition of the memoir since, Moriah had a forward. And he, in fact, was responsible for placing the memoir with a publishing house. Uh, the memoir night was turned down by some 20 publishers. Too depressing. Nobody will read it. Who cares? Finally, it was published, and a lot of people cared. The other um, relationship he had was with Cardinal Jean-Marie Lustige, who was born Jewish. His um, Father was killed. He uh, converted to save his life. But after the war, he did not reconvert back to Judaism. And when Lustiger wanted to visit Israel after the war, uh, Chief Rabbi Blau refused to meet with him, saying, I understand why he converted to save his life. I don't understand why he didn't go back to his Jewish Roots. Uh, Lassage spoke fluent Yiddish. He and Wiesel conversed in Yiddish. He spoke to himself, spoke of himself as a fulfilled Jew. And Wiesel kept questioning him, can one be Jewish and Christian simultaneously? Wiesel did not think so. And finally, Wiesel expressed deep anguish over the Mormon practice of baptizing souls of Jews 
who were murdered in the Holocaust. Uh, Wiesel wrote uh, Congressman, whatever he was at the time, Romney, uh, to try to get the practice stopped. As far as we know, there was never an answer to this letter. Now, Wiesel set up um, the Ali Wiesel Foundation for Humanity. He and his wife, Marion, did that. They sponsor an essay contest for students. They sponsor international conferences. Uh, Wiesel has left, in fact, a kind of roadmap to traverse an anti-genocidal path. You might think of his writings as a kind of guidance for the perplexed. And this is how he ends his last book, Open Heart. I still believe in man in spite of man. I believe in language even though it is wounded. And I continue to cling to words because it is up to us to transform them into instruments of comprehension rather than contempt. It is up to us to choose whether we wish to use them to curse or heal to wound or to console. Wiesel died July 2nd, 2016. Uh, the United States Congress unanimously approved uh, honoring Wiesel's life's work. The southwest corner of 84th Street in Central Park was renamed Ellie Wiesel Way. Um, a, a conclusion of sorts, although for someone who wrote nearly 60 books, it's tough to conclude. God and religious identity. If you are a Jewish, how do you reconcile the idea of a salvific God and six million dead Jews? What does that do to your religious identity? What's the relationship between the particular and the universal? Does the death of six million Jews have any universal resonance? Is it a warning for everyone else? <coughs> Pardon me. For Wiesel, the quarrel with God becomes a mission to humanity. I must do what I can to help end human suffering. The writer in me is a teacher, and the teacher in me is a writer, he always said. Only questions are eternal. Answers never are. For example, the Nazis had an answer to the Jewish question. <coughs> it was called the final solution. The result of the final solution was six million dead Jews and millions of other dead people. Questions are what bring us together. Answers are what divide us. Everyone is <coughs> concerned about getting enough food to eat, getting shelter, getting a place to sleep, talking about what constitutes a good life, helping others. These are what can bring us together. Answers never bring us together. Answers serve only to divide. So with that, uh, I conclude and uh, be happy to try to respond to questions. Thank you, Dr. Berger. Um, today's presentation is in hybrid mode, meaning we have some uh, individuals online that are also listening in. If you are online and you would like to ask a question of Dr. Berger, please put the uh, question in the uh, Q and A under the Q and A button, and we will try and get to those as quickly as we can. Any questions here from the audience? Don't be shy.
continue. So why did the United States say it was not a military party? It's a good question. Essentially, Hitler fought two wars. The war against the Allies, which he de decisively lost, and the war against the Jews, which he decisively won. The issue of why didn't the US bomb the railroad lines leading to the death camps? It's a, it's a vexing question. Uh, it's not as if it would have stopped the war, but it would, have it would have done two things. It would have delayed things, and it would have made a moral statement. This is for what you bastards are doing. We never made that statement. When we firebombed Dresden, we never connected it to the Holocaust. We never made any moral equivalency. Oh, letters were written saying that we didn't have air superiority when we did. Um, we couldn't afford the um, transfer of personnel and equipment, which we could. Uh, General George Patton, old blood and guts Patton, a great American hero, was an anti-Semite. Um, the hero of this, and from the American side, was General Eisenhower. Eisenhower demanded that photographers come to the camps and take pictures, lest, he said, in the future, people will begin denying this ever happened. Eisenhower was a hero. So too was Varian Fry, a Protestant journalist who was sent to France to try to help the Jews escape. Um, the Emergency Rescue Committee, headed by Eleanor Roosevelt, sent Fry to France to accomplish this mission. Incidentally, if there's a Roosevelt that Jews should be grateful to, it's not Franklin, it's Eleanor. Uh, Varian Fry goes to uh, France, where he meets Mark Chagall, one of the names on his list. So Chagall says to him, Tell me, Mr. Fry, are there cows in America? Because he liked to paint cows. So um, the stories are remarkable. Fry was hampered by three factors during his work. He was there for about 13 months. Hampered by the US State Department, hampered by the Vichy government, and hampered by the Nazis. One of the representatives of the US State Department said, um, I don't want any more goddamn Jews in America. So uh, there were no more. Uh, at a time when we could have rescued Jews, we didn't. Troop ships that uh, unloaded in Europe and were empty, you know, an empty ship bobs up and down like a cork. Instead of loading it with people, we loaded it with cement. So why didn't we bomb Auschwitz? It wasn't important to us. We didn't care. The Jews were expendable. Thank you for your question. Any other questions? Please. Yeah. Yeah, I know that story. Yeah. Very touching. Very touching. Yeah. Yeah. Can you repeat the question? Uh, you want to repeat the question or you want no, me to? No, you can't hear you. Oh, one of the, uh, in the War of Independence, after the War of Independence in Israel, one of the Israeli pilots uh, took a survi Holocaust survivor and up in an airplane and they flew over Auschwitz in a symbolic gesture of defiance. Thank you. We're, we're going to try and run around. There's another question over there. Just wait for the mic, please. I'm assuming that you are you know about the Avion Conference. Indeed, I do. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Um, after Kristallnacht in 1938, the night of broken glass, a uh, conference was held in Evian le bain in France. And the goal of that conference was to take X number of Jews. Each country represented the conference would take X number of Jews. So um, one after the other, the delegates stood up and made statements. 
the delegate from a country that is now friendly to Israel said the following. We have no anti-Semitism in our country because we have no Jews. In order to keep it that way, we, don't, we can't take any Jews. That was Australia. Uh, when they spoke to the concierge, incidentally, after the conference of Evian, no Jews were taken by, as refuge uh, by any other country. And each event was a test. It always is for autocrats. If you don't um, do something to stop me, I'm going to keep on going. Look at Mar Putin in Russia. After Crimea, nothing. So then the next was Ukraine. Who knows what will be next? But anyway, uh, the issue with Laban, the, uh, Evian was they interviewed the concierge. And they asked him what he remembered about this conference. And he said, ah, oh, yes, all those delegates going off to play tennis in their white shorts. It was beautiful. It wasn't too beautiful for the Jews. Related to the question, we do have an online question that I'm going to read. Um, how concerned should we be that the current efforts from some quarters to dismiss historical wrongs committed against some minorities extend to the teaching of, uh, or could extend to um, the teaching of Holocaust atrocities? Would you run that by me again? <laughs> How concerned should we be? Currently, uh, we have some individuals that um, are trying to um, dismiss historical wrongdoing. And the question here is, um, are there any concerns that that will also include teaching of Holocaust atrocities? Well, you know, the world is divided roughly into two groups. There are the good folks, and there are the moral midgets. The moral midgets are those who deny the Holocaust, although it's the most heavily documented historical event in human history. This, uh, the irony here, of course, is the very people who deny it would have been the first to applaud its successful conclusion. So are there always going to be attempts to deny reality? Yes. Are there always going to be assaults against the truth? Yes. Uh, pick up the local newspaper on any given day. Now, the truth is that truth never dies, although it leads a wretched life. It needs all the help it can get. And in the days of social media, I think this is even magnified a hundredfold. Anybody can and does say anything they want on social media. Uh, it doesn't have to come from abroad. Some of our distinguished politicians who believe that um, Jews are living in space shooting lasers filled with COVID at people in, in, in our country. I mean, it would be very funny if it weren't so serious, but these are our leaders. God help us. So yeah, we, we need to be um, vigilant, and we need to make sure that we ourselves know what the facts are. I'm sure you've noticed that there's a resurgence of novels, historical fiction, that's based on the war and Jews, and in a time when children are really not being taught much about this. I'm wondering what you think of this resurgence and if you think it will continue and how can we educate our children? The, the hardest thing is, is talking about uh, the Holocaust. And is that, do you feel that we're doing through APAC and Federation and Hadassah and everything, enough of an effort with Jewish camps and everything else uh, to perpetuate our people and our history? Yeah, that's a really good question, all right. Uh, one of the things that defines our culture are two conflicting trends. One trend, you might say, is uh, Holocaust fatigue. Enough about the Holocaust. I've heard about it. I know all about it, which means they don't. And let's move on and talk about, I don't know, the FAU Final Four. That's more exciting anyway. 
or Nathan's hot dogs or something like that. And the other trend is people who genuinely want to know more about the Holocaust. Now, what we're confronted with as educators is one word which always confronts educators, and that is ignorance. Many students know, do not know very much about history. And many students don't give a damn about history. So our challenge is to say, listen, if you don't know the past, you have no future. Um, who are you? Who are your parents? Who are your grandparents? This is a very basic thing. Um, we publish, we teach, we reflect, we speak to one another. Uh, it's a never-ending task. And I don't have any single answer to your very good question. Yeah, the, the, at times it seems to be spinning out of control. Uh, the last thing every survivor wanted, the dying wish, so to speak, was that their story be told. OK, so now it's out there. And once it's become uh, out in the public domain, it's subject to all kinds of revision, critique, uh, nonsense, lying. One Palestinian terrorist, a murderer, woman, in her jail cell in Israel, compared herself to Anne Frank. I mean, the outrages continue. Uh, the issue for us is to keep learning, keep teaching, keep engaging the students. That is what our future depends on. There are three more questions. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. How do we make sure that the teachers know enough about the Holocaust to teach the children? In my experience, the teachers know nothing about it. And we wonder why the children are not learning about it. They don't know how to teach it. How are we handling that? Not well. Not well. I think you're quite right. The issue for... Um, teaching the Holocaust as a mandate. This was passed, I think, in 1994 or six, something like that, by Palm Beach County. Mandate the teaching of the Holocaust and the teaching of black history. You know why it passed unanimously? It was an unfunded mandate. The legislature gave no money for it. If you want to have workshops, which FAU does and other universities do, then you've got to go out and raise the funds and teach. Now, the other part of your question is even more intriguing. How do you make sure that teachers are qualified to teach? Some people may resent it. Some people may be anti-Semites. Some people may not give a damn. Others say, well, you know, I've got X number of uh, lesson plan times to cover. And I, I, I'll give you an hour for the Holocaust, or maybe two hours. That's really not sufficient, is it? Is it better than nothing? It depends on the teacher. You know, in the Catholic Church, um, a promulgation comes down from the Pope, but that's just the beginning. What's the attitude of the local parish priest? What's the attitude of the people in that local parish? I mean, you can't assume that an edict is spoken and everything is in order. Not the way it works. So we have workshops, we give out awards and prizes, and we hope for the best. And until and unless we solve the issue, in my view, of the social media uh, menace, then we're in trouble. I mean, on the one hand, uh, social media is quite good. If you do research, you cut your research time probably in half, if not better much quicker. On the other hand, you have all of these nitwits and perverts out there putting up all kinds of narishkeit, all kinds of nonsense. So that's, that's a problem. And I think many in our um, legislators do not understand the issues here. So anybody in the enlightenment business will never be unemployed. I will say that. Can I ask you, what do we know about Ellie's survival in the camp? Did he stay there till the very end? And, you know, what was, how did he survive? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, for a while, his father and he 
kept each other alive. They cared for each other. They spoke to each other. They embraced each other. It's interesting about Knight. Very few pages remain in that book after his father's death. Very few pages. Uh, at one point, despite the great love and affection, he came to see his father, and his father was dying. And he said to himself, if only I could be free of this great burden, free at last. And as soon as he said it, he said uh, to himself, I felt ashamed of myself, ashamed forever. So that's what camps did. They perverted a father and son relationship. They perverted friendships. They perverted any kind of normal human interchange. But his father was a very important force in Wiesel's existence, and vice versa. But as I say, <laughs> after his father's death, he was essentially numb. And uh, you'll see by the amount of pages that are left in that book after that event happens. Uh, how influential do you think the Protocols of the Elders of Zion was and is? Yeah, how influential was and is the Protocols of the Elders of Zion? It's actually the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. It was a czarist forgery that was a czarist invention that was published in the early 20th century that claimed that uh, there was a cabal of Jewish leaders, rabbis, who were sitting around and planning to over take the world. Uh, I guarantee you they, they couldn't have done a worse job than those people who were running the world. But in any case, how influential, it's still referred to. When my wife and I were in Argentina several years ago, <coughs> you could buy a copy of that book by one of the uh, local tram stops in Buenos Aires. You can get it online in Amazon. Still, still used by certain Arab dictators and others, absolutely. Hatred has a long life, unfortunately. Uh, during the time that uh, my wife and I lived in Israel, I had a chance to visit the uh, house where the Wansee Conference was held. And over a 90-minute lunch where the final solution was adopted. Mm -hmm. And the thing that interested me, speaking of teaching and education, of the 15 men who attended that conference, most of them had doctorate degrees. 12 of the 15 did, yes. Uh, I wonder if you'd like to, to comment. Yeah, well, one thing. Education is no guarantee of compassion. Um, the late Franklin Littell, who was a Protestant scholar, used to say that the most important product of the German university was the technically competent barbarian. That is one who had great skills, really great skills, but lousy values. Uh, an example of that, Werner von Braun, the father of the US rocket program. In the closing days of the Second World War, there was a big race on in Berlin. The race was between the US and the USSR, and they were looking for Nazi scientists. We happened to get von Braun first and he became the father of our rocket program. Skills without values, absolutely. Technically competent barbarian, absolutely. So what are we to do? Today there's an emphasis on um, uh, the STEM subjects. And there needs, I mean, you can't get along in this world technologically unless you understand that thing. It's, I'm reminded of that every day my five-year-old grandson has to help me with my computer. Uh, he understands it beautifully, not me. So, but anyway, what do you do with those skills? Uh, why isn't there a, a, a corresponding emphasis on values? You have to make a decision. What am I going to do with this? Am I going to kill people or am I going to cure them? Am I going to work on a cure for cancer or am I going to build a better hydrogen bomb? It's as simple as that. And we have not yet come up with an answer. I don't know if this is just my observation or my delusion or not, but I seem to sense that the younger generation 
has very little interest in learning history, our history, history of the country that we're in. Um, things seem to have started. Um, th they seem to sense that the world started around 19, uh, around 2005 or so. Um, and I, you know, I had a sense when I was a kid growing up, and my family, that we really wanted to know where did our grandparents come from? Where did their grandparents come from? Um, you know, my great great grandfather was born in 1805. We knew that. We knew his name. It was uh, it was uh, Abraham Malofsky, and we wanted to know where he lived, and we wanted to know the stories that our that our aunts and uncles learned from my grandfather. And it seems like our kids' generation don't care. They're just not curious about this. And this, you know, this is, it's not just a Jewish issue, but it's very much centered around there. Am I, do you get the sense? Am I the only one who sees that? You're not the only one. The issue as I see it is that we started putting labels on people, you know, the generation X or generation this or generation that. It's nonsense. There isn't any kind of core curriculum which stresses history anymore. Uh, I've been teaching for many years, and I noted that um, there are fewer and fewer texts in common that I have with my students. If you make a reference to a certain text, they'll wonder what you're talking about. But of course, these folks never saw a typewriter. They never saw a rotary phone. The world is moving ahead technologically by leaps and bounds. And they simply can't be bothered. If it happened more than a, a year ago, it's uh, ancient history. That's a problem for us. And I think that um, if you watch some of these shows on television, the dumbing down of the country just uh, proceeds apace. So that intellectuals, for example, are looked on with some suspicion. In America, we've always had this anti-intellectual bias. There was, in the 19th century, a part, political party called the Know-Nothings. They were proud of it. Uh, imagine being proud of being called a Know-Nothing. Uh, it's hard to believe. But how do, we, how do we address the issues you raise? Well, there should be a core curriculum that stresses history, that stresses um, where do you come from? You mentioned your grandparents, uh, your parents. Who are you? Um, what did your father do? What did your grandfather do? Uh, how do you fit into the great stream of human history? We don't ask these questions anymore. Um, and I think one other thing that is a defining characteristic for us is the lack of community. We each seem to be living in our own silo. So I'm here, you're there, somebody else is over here. Uh, my wife and I were recently in Spain. And so we went down the wrong way, of course, in this one-way alley. Maybe there was this much space on either side of the car. People stopped, they were helping us. People reaching in the open window, <laughs> steering the wheel. I mean, the sense of kind of community. We don't have that general. We have it in certain areas and in certain situations. And I think the other thing that's bothersome, to put it mildly, is a lack of confidence in facts. We have alternative facts now. They used to be called lies. Now they're called alternative facts. So we don't know, uh, really, uh, these kids are being uh, deceived. I mean, Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of porridge. I don't even think our kids are getting the porridge. But they're selling their birthright because they don't know anything. And they don't know they don't know anything. Of course, there are exceptions to this. And of course, it's not all bleak. Of course not. 
but it's tending in the wrong direction, I would say. I appreciate your question. Okay, we are out of time. Um, for those of you here in the audience, I know you have still have a question, but we are out of uh, time. So for you, for those of you here in the audience, feel free to come up to Dr. Berger and chat with him. Those of you online, feel free to reach out, you know, either to us in the Division of Research. Again, my name is Karen Scapinato. You can reach me or Dr. Berger directly. We'd be happy to answer any questions. With that, thank you very much, thank Dr. You. Berger. Thank you.